Good, James. So what's it like knowing that, you know, you're part of a, a lineage that keeps going and going and there'll be somebody asking you to keep it going and going and going? <laughs> It, it's a very good lesson in life. You are completely insignificant and uh, the world is much bigger and better than you are. <laughs> so, you know, we've had three of these now through Kenneth Brownog. And, you know, what's your take coming into this, knowing that they want to continue these series, especially for the big screen? We're not seeing it. You know, obviously, you know, th there's stories throughout the last century, whether it's on TV, there's the books, but now we're getting the big screen treatment. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's nothing like a Hollywood movie, is there? Um, there's nothing like the scale. There's nothing like the scope. There's nothing like the talents involved. Um, you look at the cast that we've managed to put together for these three movies. It's it's an extraordinary array of talent, um, Oscar winners, you know, everything. Um, mm. I, You know, the thing that these do is they give us reach to an audience that you know, you can't get in other ways. I mean, our TV is pretty global, but these put it on a completely different scale. And that opens up everything. You know, it helps people. Um, it brings people to the books. It brings people to plays. It brings things, people to other things we do. So it is it is an incredible thing um, that we have, you know, got back on the Hollywood trail again. Um, it's It's great fun as well. At what point in your life did you pick up the mantle and say, now it's my turn? You know, how much did you, when did you have to start reading the books, learning the business before you're at this position now? Well, I mean, there's sort of, again, there are probably two answers to that question. One of which is kind of, it's always been there in the background. Um, it was never agreed. It was never, it was ne neither forced on me nor nor was it a given that it would be given to me, as it were. Um, I've got two siblings. It, it was always possible, I guess, that one of them might have might have done it. Um, I only really <laughs> knew I was going to do it when I started doing it, uh, which is, what, seven or eight years ago, just actually before Murder on the Orient Express came out. Um, but then in the background, you know, I've been, I guess, preparing for it all my life. You know, I've been, I started reading the books probably when I was nine or ten, um, and, you know, have read them on or off throughout my life. Um, I spent my early life working in publishing, which is preparation in, in parts for all of this. Um, but, it, you know, it's a family business. Um, I've sat around the dinner table discussing this with my father since since I was a child, discussing it with my grandmother as well. Um, you know, it's it's in the blood somewhere. <laughs> for this particular film, you know, the cinematography is great, the score is great. You know, how much do you get involved in trying to make sure that Ken's vision and the books are aligned? Granted, you have to take liberties when you're making a film, but you also want it to be aligned for those who read the book. Yeah, well, I mean, this, as as I'm sure you're aware, is, is quite a departure from the book. Um, that was deliberate. Michael Green came to us and having made two very faithful adaptations with Murder on the Orient Express and Death on the Nile, wanted to do something a different, bit different, wanted to do something tonally a bit different. Um, I see my role as protecting um, the general nature of my great-grandmother's work. We have a phrase we use here called an Agatha Christie experience, and that is kind of the test we put against all of our story, all of our projects. So to me, this is very much an Agatha Christie experience. It's a murder mystery at its heart. Um, Michael and Ken have, have played with the story, played with the genre a little bit, played with the tone, um, but it is still an Agatha Christie project, and that's what I'm here to to try and test on. Mm -hmm. Whether it be a film, a play, or a TV series, you know, uh, how much is 50-50, 80% or so forth in terms of the alignment of what, you know, you know, as you mentioned, trying to make sure that the vision is still there, even though they want to make something different? Um, I don't... I don't work in those kind of percentage terms, really. Um, I have an overall feel. Um, we see a lot of potential projects here. Um, we make some, we don't make others. And pretty quickly, you get an idea of, of in, in my term, whether someone gets it. And very quickly here, you we, told, we could tell that Michael Green, the writer, and Ken Branagh get it. And that is, at the end of the day, the key to it. If you understand it and you have a feel for the work you can then depart from it you can then make your adaptations you can interpret it in your way 
if you don't get it, you, that's when it's going to go wrong. So it all starts at the beginning. And that's really where I see my role is, is picking our partners, making sure that they're the right ones. And then once you pick them, letting them, trusting them to, to do the right thing with the work. What's been the joy of this legacy continuing on for so long? And it still goes on, no matter how you put it together, you know, or in different platforms, that here is the name that everybody knows. No matter what the story is, as long as you have Agatha Christie in front of it, you kind of know what you're going to get. And you still want to enjoy it. Um, it's an extraordinary privilege. I mean, you know, it is. Um, it's quite humbling, really, to be to be to be behind it. Um, it's quite scary as well. There's always the fear that I'll mess the whole thing up. Hopefully, I won't. Um, the great thing is we have this incredible raw material. She um not only wrote great stories but she wrote a lot of them and that gives us a flexibility and a freedom to do all sorts of things and to continue to doing projects and hopefully you know that will that will go on for some time yet all i can say is congrats on having another film out congrats on keeping the legacy alive and, and roland obviously this is a never-ending story so whether it be you or any siblings or generations after that we're going to still have it going on well i i spent a lot of my childhood being told that you know at some point this would all come to an end i think we can be quite clear it won't now i think my great-grandmother will will go on for a very long time being read and being watched on screen so yeah thank you for your time it's, it's been good talking to you take care yourself <laughs> thank you bye hi 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 hilda <laughs> hi Wilson. so oh there you go so obviously, you know, does a film and does a task, you know. So when you come into making a movie, specifically like this, what goes into creating the score? Is it something that you look at the film first, or is it that you get the script and you know what angle of track you're gonna put in? Mm. Well, I normally come into the process quite early. That is my um it's kind of my preferred way of, of working. So so I, I joined the project as they were still filming and um and then I, I started writing the music kind of as they were starting to wrap up the filming and and, and uh, entering the editing phase and, and Ken and I had a lot of discussions about his ideas <clears throat> for the film and what he wanted to how he wanted to get to where he wanted to go and and um and that's just a really a joy to to work in that way, you know. To, when you're working with a director that has such clarity and such a such a strong vision for for what it is that he's he's doing, and he always kept the course, you know, that which was uh, really really wonderful. And and uh, so I was able to write a lot of music uh, in the very very early stages that that um based on his uh, based on his guidelines that were kind of like um atonal chamber pieces of music that that were kind of referencing the the music history of of uh, of this time you know the, the 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 time where composers were were throwing away their old their old ideas about melody and harmony and and you know heading towards a more experimental and, and uh, atonal uh, tonality and uh, so the so the score kind of travels travels this this journey of this this uh, um, pre-war idea of, of of romantic melody and and uh, the post-war uh, restructuring of, of what music of what music is and um and it was really great to start to, to start so early in the process to to write because then the edit was able to grow into the music and and you know then they handed that that they're added over to me and I was able to work the music more into that and 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 therefore it, it unfolded very naturally the connection between the um the film and the and the music. So I was gonna ask that, you know, like for you and particularly this particular film, and I followed Kenneth's film for years and he's always used Patrick Doyle. <laughs> and so like I think about like, okay, when you're coming on board, is it a matter of knowing the director and the and the music he normally goes with is or as you just mentioned, the genre or the time frame, you know, you're mentioning the early, you know, the time frame of this movie or the genre, you know, so like you kind of know what the audience is going to look for, or you kind of, you don't want to make it so predictable in terms of what hearing the score, you know, mm -hmm. so what works best for you? Is it knowing 
the time frame, you know, when you think about that time period, like, okay, this is the type of music that would have played during that time, or mm-hmm. is it the, the genre? Mm-hmm. Well, I think for for me, it's it's really when when I'm working on a, on a film, I'm I'm really just focused like deep in, into that specific project. So I tend to I tend to try to steer away from um you know franchises or or or, or, or films that are like projects that have um a lot of cultural baggage you know as 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 much as i can but so so this film for example it it is obviously a part of a, a series of films that that sits within you know a, a sort of franchise if you will <laughs> this this series of of films but it was very um clear to uh to Ken that he wanted it to be completely different from the um from the other films so there was really in his mind, not really a connection to the other films, at least musically. <laughs> so, so I kind of deliberately stayed away from from referencing any any of the other scores musically, or or, or and it can also, I think, in <clears throat> in general, it can just be quite complicated when you're working into a into a franchise or when you're working into into previous uh ideas you know it becomes a little bit um the process becomes a bit different you know you're not just creating from yourself but you're creating in a in a lineage of 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 of, of other other processes you know so so for me it works better to to just focus on the on the task at hand and and that's also really what what ken was expecting i think but as in um whereas the genre is is uh, uh uh, um, yeah, seeing the seeing the genre, I have such a strong idea about what um what I feel like a um you know a detective you know like a you know a noir noir film or a, you know an Agatha Christie film like a who done it how that should be made you know because I I grew up with with these books and and so I have such a long standing idea of what I would like to see in this in this genre so so I really try to through to uh work also from that perspective of that's you know so why I've always wanted to um do a um a who done it because I, I I feel like uh, I wanted to try out these ideas that I've had for so long <laughs> having said that and having worked on other scores and for anybody that listens to your music is it challenging making sure you're coming up with something original so that the way they don't they know that you're not repeating yourself you know because sometimes mm-hmm. composers can have a signature track they, they don't know, but for followers, they know it, whether it be five seconds or 30 seconds. You know, like mm-hmm. I've done, a, I, I've interviewed composers, I've listened to a lot of their music. I can tell Michael Nyman and, you know, when his his music, when it's Jerry Goldsmith, all of those guys. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so they, yeah. Know, sure, is it challenging to come up with something new? Well, I think it's a, I think it's a balance, you know, because I, I think, of course, you know, as a composer and, and and as a person, you will always have a specific way of communicating. You know, even just as a as a person speaking, you know, you will use the same turn of phrase. You know, quite often. So 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 there is definitely uh, a mannerism about you know just being a person, and I think the same goes for being a composer. You know, I, I think it's. Um, you know, I, I think it's a good thing to have an identity that you can you can hear that you know that that is this person. I I I see that more as a as a positive thing than a than a negative thing. And and um, but of course you're always you, you don't want to get stuck. You know, so you wanna you want to continue to explore and you want to continue to create and and um, so of course you want to try out new things and you want to you know, not con- continuously repeat yourself, you know, so, but I think it's a, it's just a, it's just a balance. And, and of course, you know, you, you just show up for each project with, with your, your best intention of, of just bringing the, the, hopefully the best, you know, that you have to that project and, and, uh, and, uh, and hopefully that, that, um you know, that serves the, serves the film. <laughs> Congrats on the music. Congrats on the gig. I'm sure I'll, well, I'll hear more from you <laughs> down Thanks. the road. Yeah. So take care of yourself. Yeah, you too. Great to meet you. Bye. Bye.
Hey, Harris, how's it going? Wilson Morales from Black Feminine TV. Hi, Wilson. Nice to meet you. I'm well. Hope you are too. Good. And also, you're you're one of Ken's team. You know, I always say this. There are these guys that work with directors. They've been with them for a long period of time. There's you. There's Patrick Doyle. So when it comes to making the third Christie film, you know, how much more went into looking for the, the, the places? And I'm sure you've had help in terms of the location scouts. <laughs> well, um, I think we approach this as we approach every film, as if it's the first and last film we will ever make both together or just in general. And, and what you do is you, you cherish the, the, the work and um, uh, you kind of dedicate yourself to the interpretation of, of the story. And I think um, there's certain ways where I think we've always, you know, in particular in, in location scouting, as you've just asked, like that approach is with Kenneth, it's always one where we start very, very early in the morning but before lights come up and people have woken up and you kind of just experience this city in a way that I think always is, is a little bit more timeless than when you, mm-hmm. when you see it in the hustle and bustle of midday, in particular in a city like Venice, which is a kind of a, a hugely visited city. Um, that kind of visual input that you get the first time when it's quieter, darker, um, uh, and far from the crowds is a, is, a, is a very different kind of city. And it's a city, I think, that seems to stand the test of time a bit more at those, at those hours and, and feels more like it was maybe 50 years ago or 100 years ago, more so than it does when, when you see people in modern clothing and... Um, uh, uh, and it's just you and the seagulls in a funny way. Um, so th- that plus kind of very fortunate that the city of Venice gave us uh, 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 great access to some of its historic buildings and its balconies and its squares um, and its canals that we were, we were just often looking for that kind of um, uh, sight unseen, a kind of a, 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 an interpretation of this of this. Um, of this particular kind of city that was um, in tune with the story, um, and it's a, a really dark story. So we were we were we were looking for the darker part of Venice in that regard. Yeah, like one can expect to see you know people on a boat, you know, <laughs> but the sculptures mm. and the settings, you know, those were some beautiful shots. It was it a matter of knowing when to shoot it? Was it day or night to get the right? lighting and the right visualness of it yes and the right absolutely that the right angles because those angles you know those people staring down all those saints and statues staring down at everyone it seemed to be in line with the story um and you know there 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 are a lot of dead people in stone uh, on the top of buildings in 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 venice and again um just things that happen. We, we just noticed that at those times of day, it was just us and the seagulls and the pigeons and things like that, and less of uh, the human aspect of things. And we were shooting St. Mark's Square early in the morning and, and, and some pigeons. And, and in, in, things happen, you know, you, when you open yourself up to that. I mean, uh, a, a terrible day in the life of a pigeon, but uh, it was a cinematic moment for us. Um, that was unscripted, but a seagull did swoop down and 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 take a pigeon while we were shooting and that's in the film but that was not scripted set up um that just uh uh uh, that just happened and that seemed to be you know it wasn't a particularly breathtaking uh view of venice uh you couldn't see saint mark's cathedral you really could only see the floor and some pigeons of the square um so you would i would say that was quite a banal um point of view um and and that's what we wanted it to be and it became a a really kind of uh uh a poetic moment of the fragility of life in the end when that happened and that was not you know i'm glad um um ken and our wonderful editor lucy put it in the film um because it it's a great opening in a way having worked with ken over the you know long period of time how that relationship goes in terms of like is it more or less like you guys know each other you, you guys know each other well enough to know that 
even though this is based on a book, you have to go kind of align it to what the book has. He trusts you well enough to like let you be before you guys can have a, uh, that conversation. How does that work? There's certainly trust, but there is never anything taken for granted. I, I mean, I think we really start from scratch. I, I think the key to any kind of lasting professional uh, relationship is is one of, of proper communication and an assumption is is not a great way of communicating i i find i i'd rather go in there he is so well prepared he is so well versed um and and i i i, I, I have to reciprocate that uh, passion for the story with equal passion and equal kind of um uh uh obsession to detail and and I also, you know, that's there's a professional side of all of that, which you, you have to. But there's also I also see a friendship part of that where I see my my uh, a friend that is taking on an incredible role of of performer, director, uh, uh, producer and the stress that it creates and the 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 the, the amount of time. That, that, and, and thought that has to be put into that process. So um, I value that relationship and, um, and, and try and give as much as I can to that, that him being able to perform at his best in that. And, and that basically goes by, by just doing your job really well and making sure that it goes kind of as smoothly and effortlessly as possible and that you know you respond and listen quickly and intuitively and that you you then you know then you can achieve the things you want to achieve because especially when it comes to those kind of denouement scenes that we have at the end of every uh, 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 Poirot film I mean that's 10 pages of monologue that have to be performed to and he performs them to the utmost level and and he performs those while looking at an ensemble cast and noting what they're doing. It, it, he takes on a great deal, and um, it would be it, it would. I, I think I'd be doing a disservice if I wasn't attentive to the huge dedication and passion he puts into a a, a, pro, a project. Job well done. Congrats on the you know the scope of the film. You know I'm sure you guys will work together again. You guys do well together. So I'll be looking forward to your next project. Take care. Nice meeting you, Wilson. Nice chatting to you. Uh-huh.